Hey everybody, senior writer Katie Reif of the AV Club here. This week, A.A. Dowd is away covering the Sundance Film Festival, so we've got a very special guest. Hi, Ignati. Hi, Katie. I'm glad to be here. Ignati Vishnevetsky will be joining me today while we talk about the Russian drama Beanpole. Welcome to Film Club. So this film, Beanpole, it's the second feature by a very young Russian director, mm -hmm. Kantemir Balagov, and I know that you really like this. Yeah, I like this film. It did win a prize for its direction at last year's Cannes Film Festival, and I felt that it was very well directed. It does a great, an interesting balancing act of it is a bleak film where a lot of very depressing things happen, and there are a lot of twisted interpersonal dynamics. People treat each other very poorly, but it looks beautiful. It looks like a painting from one of the great masters. The composition is like very thoughtful and the lighting he utilizes what I guess you could call tricks with you know different lighting color temperatures and things like that but he doesn't overdo it you know he doesn't go full Dario Argento with yeah. it when I thought that particular balance of like gorgeous aesthetics and very bleak brutal emotional truth Mm -hmm. is a combination that uh, always appeals to me in filmmaking. I mean, I, yo, I know, I, I love the bleak stuff myself. Mm -hmm. So this film is, it's set in a fairly bleak period. Yes. It's set after the end of World War II. Mm -hmm. in 1945. Saint, yeah, in St. Petersburg, then called Leningrad. Mm -hmm. And it starts out in a hospital with Ia, this mm -hmm. woman who works as a kind of an attendant, a nurse, not quite a nurse in the hospital. Yeah. And who has a young boy. Ia is unusually tall. She sort of towers over everyone else in the film. So I don't think this really qualifies as a spoiler because mm -hmm. it's the inciting incident of the film. It happens basically within the first 15 minutes of a movie that runs two hours and 20 minutes about. It's pretty long. Mm -hmm. But this boy, Pashka, dies. And pretty much right after, we learn that he's not in fact her biological son, but he's the son of her friend, Masha, who returns mm -hmm. to Leningrad to learn that her boy has died. And her reaction to hearing her boy has died is, let's go dancing. Mm -hmm. And that kind of speaks to all the characters in this film. They've all been uh, you know, deeply affected by their experiences in the war one way or another. And the physical aftermath of it can be seen on the ward where Ia works, where a lot of the patients are missing limbs or missing, you know, missing an eye. One man is paralyzed from the neck down and asks the doctor who runs the ward to kill him. He says, I don't want to live like this. That's sort of the general atmosphere that she works in. Not many people ever really leave this hospital. Yeah. <laughs> a very cheerful post-war mood. Yes, yes. Also, there are a lot of psychological effects from the war, and Ia has a very visible psychological effect. She has um, seizures. She mm -hmm. has these seizures where she, she freezes, and the film actually opens with you hear a, like a guttural choking sound yeah. on the on the soundtrack, but it, the screen's still black. And, and then it fades into her having one of these seizures in the middle of the laundry room at the hospital and everyone's working around her. And mm -hmm. she just stands there and kind of seizes for a, a couple minutes. And then one of the other workers says, oh, don't worry about her, that's just how she is. Yeah. And that is, and it's actually one of these seizures that leads to her accidentally killing the boy. Yeah. And it just very subtly shifts from sort of a warm domestic scene into this absolutely horrifying moment. Yeah, I mean, I think there's no denying that Balagov knows how to frame a scene, you know, to do something really within the space of one shot. Mm -hmm. This is a, a, fair, a movie of fairly long takes. Yes that are, you know, they're, they're very deliberately constructed. And it, at its center is really, it's the Masha-Ia mm -hmm. relationship. We learn more about as the film goes on, but which also involves in, evolves in kind of grotesque ways. Yes. And you know what it, it reminded me of the most is, is Fassbinder. Mm. Uh, Rainer Werner Fassbinder, of course, the great uh, German director of uh, mostly the 70s, mm -hmm. who made, you know, like 40 movies before expiring in his mid 30s. Yeah, very young. Who, who I think was better than almost anyone at dramatizing uh, codependencies that mm -hmm. as they exist in a cruel society filled with unresolved issues. I mean, that's basically what this film is about. It's about this relationship, but we also, the idea that this relationship exists within just layers and layers of unresolved 
trauma. Right, yeah, the the ever the repression of the trauma is, you know, all around them. They're standing in the literal rubble and no one really, you know, acknowledges it and everyone just goes on, gets up and goes to work and yeah, I mean, doesn't uh, talk about it. I think it can sometimes be hard to understand the uh, extent to which World War II, the Great Patriotic War, is both, I think, a, a cultural myth and a cultural trauma for the countries of the former Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. This film is set in Leningrad. The siege of Leningrad is the deadliest siege in the history of modern warfare, probably of all warfare. You know, millions of people died. The city was under siege for two and a half years. Mm -hmm. um, there's a point where people in the hospital ask Pashka, the boy, to bark like a dog, and mm. he doesn't know how to. And so one of the patients says, well, how would he know all the dogs were eaten? Yeah, because the boy can't be older than two. Yeah, and it seems like a very kind of grim, miserablest moment, but it's kind of the reality of the situation. Mm -hmm. I don't think this film ever really, you know, everything we're talking about, sound, it sounds really heavy, and it is, but I don't, this film doesn't really pass into a place of what you might call misery porn or yeah. trauma porn, where it's just wallowing in all this bleakness and misery for its own sake. Do you think it's partly because it's long? I mean, a lot mm. happens to it, but it, these scenes are kind of able to develop in a way where it doesn't feel like a relentless onslaught of bad getting worse and worse and worse. I mean, I think that uh, the length does help because it is a very character-based film. Ian Masha never really talk about what happened when they were together on the front because they were together on the front before Ia got discharged because of her seizures, which mm -hmm. they call post-concussion syndrome in the film, which I think is sort of antiquated term for PTSD. Mm -hmm. well, well, like shell shock, yeah. Right, yeah. So they never really talk about what happened but there is a lot that just like passes between them. And a lot of the film is in uh, dialogue. There's a lot of dialogue scenes with the two of them where, where, where they are conveying a lot that they're not actually saying out loud. Yeah. And I think that that's sort of like long and like you said, Balogov does allow the scenes to continue to their yeah. logical endpoint. He doesn't cut away. He allows things to, con to complete. And I think that that is what gives you a more full understanding of the situation rather than just looking at like the, the surface of the circumstances. If I have uh, some issues with the film, I think one of them is, I think the character of Ia just feels too artificial. She doesn't really feel like a human being mm. in the way that some of the other characters do. Like they all, all the characters in the film have a very clear rhetorical purpose. Sure. You know, they're representing certain kinds of trauma and certain yes. kinds of relationship, but there's at least these characters seem to exist in a reality. Mm -hmm. I feel like Ia is almost too stylized of a character. She just, you know, she barely talks. And when she does talk, it's in this kind of and She's whisper. got this very cowed yeah. posture, like a like a, a an abused dog, yeah. you know, kind of is like this. And I, most of the cast here are not professional actors, but I feel like there she's really just, I feel like she's cast mostly for stature. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, sure. Yeah. You know, she physically fits the bill, absolutely, mm -hmm. for what was presumably written in the script as a very tall, thin, pale woman. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting, you said that every character kind of stands in for a different type of trauma, and I do think that that's definitely true. With Ia and Masha, like, every, like Ia, everything is on her face. You know, you can see on her face, her mm -hmm. reactions to things when people talk and all that. Um, but Masha is, she never, she, everything is internal with yeah. her. But it's all, maybe that's why the character of Ia feels more shallow because it is expressed on the surface more. There's, there's some transference that goes on and you know what it kind of reminded me mm. of at a certain point is Altman's Three Women. Mm. Mm -hmm. You know, kind of the, the Shelley Duvall and Sissy Spacek yeah, characters. Yeah, yeah. And also, you know, Ia being like a very silent character from the beginning. Yeah. Whereas, well, Masha's not necessarily chatty, but a lot more She's, outgoing and aggressive. Yes, she is the one who says, let's go out, you yeah. know, let's, she doesn't want to think about what happened to yeah. her, which as you mentioned, is another cope, a common yeah. coping mechanism. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a movie <laughs> in which we're always aware of the fact that none of the characters want to deal with any of this. Mm -hmm. You know, they've been through something absolutely terrible and life has quote unquote gone back to normal. Mm -hmm. But all we see is the fact, you know, the, the walls are cracked. You know, uh, people are jumping in front of, uh, you know, tram cars yep. every day. What we see is, you know, the fact that it's it's not even a facade that works. When they go out to the, you, if you remember, they go out to the dance hall and it's closed. And it's closed. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and so they end up just drinking with some guys in a car. Yeah. <laughs> 
Now, I enjoyed the movie's sort of painterly cinematography, mm -hmm. but I understand that you weren't completely sold on that. It looks a little bit too much like Delicatessen. Oh! It's a little, <laughs> it's a little, it's a little too much like um, of, a, of a peeling wallpaper fetish. Oh, okay, you know? yes, the yes, golden yes. The golden glow. The Jean-Pierre Jeunet. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yes. Early, the... early Darius Kanji kind of uh -huh. look, you know? and this emphasis on greens. Mm -hmm. Green is a very obviously symbolic color. But you know what the thing is? I feel like these are my clever film critic responses mm. where I'm like, oh, this is all obvious symbolism, you mm -hmm. know? These characters are thin caricatures. When the reality is, you know, when you think of, you know, and obviously I'm thinking of Fassbender films here, mm -hmm. I often think of how those movies, which are so blatant in their symbolism yes, and in their, yes, they're in also their shot very compositions, obvious. are full of people just slathered in makeup that looks, you know, like they're being embalmed. <laughs> and it's, there's like weird wallpaper everywhere and people are standing in unnatural ways. Um, I keep thinking about how those movies would be received today, you know? Yeah. I feel like there's something very, very undisciplined. I feel, you know, mm -hmm. Balagov, he's, he's 27. He, it's interesting, he belongs to really the first generation of Russian filmmakers who were not, who have no memory of the Soviet Union right. whatsoever. Right. He hasn't really learned to, you know, hide his themes behind, you know, realism and mm -hmm. that kind of, that craftiness. Um, everything comes through very directly. You know, you know what this film is about. But, I, you know, he's addressing issues that need to be addressed, things yeah. that need to be dealt with. Right, and I mean, I have, perhaps a slightly higher tolerance for that sort of artifice. Yeah. I actually kind of enjoy that sort of artifice, as particularly, and I don't know what this says about me as a person, particularly when it's uh, combined with themes that are maybe a little thorny or challenging mm -hmm. or characters who are kind of cruel to each other. There, Because I do also like uh, Fassbender films. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's their modus operandi yeah, too. Yeah. So uh, it, it's just something that, like, I see where you're coming from, that it no. is very obvious. <laughs> but it's fine, like, movies... But it's a good but it's a good point that he's making in an obvious way, yeah. so I can't be too harsh on it. Well, yeah, and I feel like nice people are usually pretty easy to understand. Mm -hmm. I feel like movies are a really good way for exploring characters who are difficult, mm -hmm. um, maybe even cruel, as I, I think a lot of characters in this film are. All right, everybody, that's all we've got for today. Please join us again next week, where we will be talking about the remainder of this year's Best Picture nominees. And meanwhile, don't forget to like and subscribe to the AV Club's YouTube channel. I'm Katie Reif. And I'm Ignati Vishnevetsky. Thanks for joining us.